we're going to do. I, I do want to start by uh, saying a general one. We're not all here. I don't get to go to Bob Johnson's session, which is, or Jessica's, which is too bad. But I do want to say thank you to them for organizing uh, what I thought is, is just a terrific conference then with the quality of presentation yesterday that really keeps the pressure on uh, to do a good job. Uh, and I was uh, very impressed with, with everything we've had so far and, and delighted for the chance to be here. I think you should think of this session. Uh, we've, we've heard a lot of exciting things from Alex last night about computing and changes in the web and, uh, and what's coming, but there's also days when you need something to do in class. I think you think of this as the holy cow, I didn't realize that I would have to pick up my son up at school and I didn't know uh, that that dentist appointment would take so long and I need to teach something in 20 minutes. Uh, what am I going to do? Well, hopefully this will give you kind of a free pass for four or five of those for the coming year. Uh, basically, this is things you can do in statistics that are either a supplement to or an alternate, an alternative to a basic lecture. And the, uh, I'm a real believer that it, I, I do lecture sometimes. I certainly have days where I just go over homework and present new material. But I think if you can intersperse that with days when you do things that are really different and exciting, a little different. Uh, get people actively learning in class. Uh, I think that's a good thing. And I have just a collection of ones that I've tried here that have worked fairly well for me. Probably people have some of their own favorites. I have several others that I didn't bother to include because I, I think they're a little more dicey. But these are ones I think you could do almost uh, in almost any class. Uh, but I wanted to start off with one that was the poultry rate activity. My idea is to do that in every group because I, I think it's a really good one. Jessica talked about this yesterday, that there are variables you like to collect in class and you might want to collect at the second. We're going to do that here. We're going to collect pulse rates in this class. And if anybody has a reason that they don't want to tell me your pulse, you don't want to tell me your pulse rate, that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll issue a disclaimer that not taking your pulse will be fine. But we're going to start right now by just doing a little in-class data collection because I found that students are more interested in dull data about themselves than in what I think is interesting data about the rest of the world. I, I've often come into class with what I think is a tremendously interesting and valuable data set and been really surprised at the yawns that it produces. Whereas if you ask them about their own pulse, they get pretty interested. So uh, let's go ahead and, and take our pulse now. Everybody can look around, find your favorite spot, neck or wrist or uh, uh, your favorite. And I'll give you a few more seconds to locate it, and I'll tell you when to start counting. Everybody got it? Okay. Start. Take what you have. That was 30 seconds. Uh, so take what you have and uh, double it, and that'll, that's your uh, current pulse rate. And so what I'd like to do is just take a sample of people in the class. Uh, I'm also a big believer in, in randomizing in class, uh, so I think I'll go ahead and, and randomize. But just just for uh, just for the sake of showing I'm not shy about my own pulse rate, I'll uh, point out that I had a 58. I've always been interested in pulse rates. I'm a, a pretty regular runner, and I've always liked thinking about that. And in college, I had a classroom with one of those clocks that clicks every one minute, and I didn't have a watch. And I had the world's most uh, boring teacher for a numerical analysis <laughs> class, a guy who never turned around, and there were only four of us. So I used to play this game to see if I could get my pulse to go below 50 without falling asleep uh, <laughs> in class. And it was hard because sometimes, you know, you only got that input every one minute, and sometimes I'd think, oh, today's it, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it, but then I'd get excited. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I never did, <laughs> did it at the time. I think I could now. Uh, so let's get some other uh, pulse rates around the room. I'm, I have a random number table here. We may all get one later, depending on which problems you choose to have me do. But I'll just pick a column and kind of number the room around this way. Number five would be Peter. Do you mind sharing yours? Seven. Seventy? Is this the third second grade or are we going to 
Yeah, double it. The, this is the one minute guy. So jump, double what you got. We, we should get even numbers unless you're really good at counting. Uh, <laughs> counting half beats. Let's see. 15, 6, 10, 15 would be uh, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, and your name's? Chris. Chris? We wanted more variance than that, Chris. Um, but it's okay. Just, you know, that, these things happen when you use, uh, live, when you use live data. Okay, uh, 17 would be yours. Yeah. Yeah. Zero. Oh, oh, you came in, uh, you came in after, we came in after we counted. Okay. That, that, that also happens. Uh, 18, Scott? Scott's was 64. Okay, and uh, let's see, we'll pick, uh, we'll just do one more. Four, the way I was counting would be what? 90. 90? Oh, well, that's exciting. It's exciting to be the presenter. <laughs> that's okay. That's good. I, I, I like introducing old everybody. That's enough for now. In class, I would probably get some more, uh, and I would collect all those. I try to collect some data from the class on a worksheet and kind of build in a class database sometimes as the semester goes on so we have some data to work with about the students themselves. But let me ask you this question, which we have on there. What causes the pulse rates to be different? We have five people, they all have different pulse rates. Why are they different? So, what is it about people's pulses, about people, that causes their pulse rates to be different? What? Yeah. Coffee, okay. Uh, more, maybe more generally, let's say caffeine. I'm, I'm drinking a cup of tea, but something to do with caffeine. Very good. Uh, what else? What are some factors about people that underlying variables? And I'm not, by the way, feel free to shout out any variables because I'm not going to collect these on you guys today. Age, uh, heart size. That, that would be a hard one to measure. I would like to stick to things that we could have a quick measure of, although that's obviously an important one. Uh, what else? Wait. Wait. <laughs> Medication. Pardon? Medication. Medication? Yeah. How recently they moved. Okay. Uh, uh, time, time since they ate. What else affects people's faults? Uh, some sort of physical condition, yeah. So we might, well, wait, might we measure about that? You could ask kids in class if they know fairly quickly, maybe hours that amount they exercise per week or something like that. So uh, some sort of hours of exercise. That's a good proxy for things like metabolism that you know you can't measure maybe without a lab, but you want to have things you can measure in class. Okay, what else? They just if you uh, time since exercise, yeah. Uh, that might that might matter. I can think of at least one, uh, one or two other good pulse predictors. Vice. Pardon? Vice. Uh, smoking would, would smoking and non-smoking would, would probably be one that people would think is important in uh, pulse. Uh, I think we got almost enough. Anybody else got a favorite? Okay. Well, let's take a, a look at those for a minute and think. Uh, there, there's a list of things that you can measure fairly easily about students in class and which for the most part, at least if they're identified anonymously, they're not uh, shy about sharing. Uh, let's take a look at what are some of the topics we cover in the first statistics course? Again, we yeah. start to assume part. Data collection. Data collection. Okay, well we just did that. We collected some data. So let's think about what about this exercise here. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make is a little, little bit of in-class data goes a long way because almost everything you do in a first statistics course, you can do with this sort of data that you collected from your own class. We already did the data collection today, and in it, because I'm dealing with teachers, I didn't spend a lot of time, but what did we already do? We already did a randomization. We already, you know, we're, we're careful about randomization, but we do have a question to ask, which would be, if we think we want to draw some conclusions about pulse rates in the population, we have to think uh, what, what population are we working with here? Is it, could we, the population of people at this conference, I think we have a good sample of that, uh, because you were probably fairly randomly assigned to your colors. 
Uh, it's probably not a terrible representation of statistics teachers. It's probably still a pretty good representation of uh, college faculty. How far up can we go and still say that any conclusions we draw about this group are, are reasonable? You know what? The, the questions that come up in data collection are all come up here, and people, especially students, have an opinion about whether they're like or unlike other people. So that's a good one. What are some other topics? Reporting data. Sure. Uh, uh, basically, descriptive, you know, we do descriptive statistics. And probably one of the things I like to emphasize under that is, in particular, different types of variables. And by the way, if you are so inclined, there's plenty of uh, space on the handout to fill these in as we go. I didn't want to list them all ahead because I knew it would be a little different from section to section. But we think of variables as being categorical or discrete or continuous. We have all of those here? I think so, right? Because uh, for continuous variable, we have age, weight, things that you could measure pretty much on an interval. Uh, for uh, discrete variables, uh, well, probably hours of exercise a week, people are going to give you a small integer number. You can probably think of that as a discrete variable. We have plenty of categor uh, categorical variables, like smoker and non-smoker. Oh, another one we didn't get on. <coughs> uh, another simple categorical variable. So we have almost every type of variable that we ever talk about. And thinking about what's the difference. It's, uh, I don't know about you guys, but often when I teach, I like to have students do a couple little projects during the semester. And I've often used the Moore and McKay textbook, which has a little section on correlation and regression uh, at the start. And I'll assign students a first project. And no matter how often you say, correlation is a measure between two numerical continuous variables, or discrete variables with a lot of possible values, students will still come in and say, oh, you know what? I think. Uh, I think smoking or not smoking is really correlated with whether you're from New York State or not. And I'll think, well, they might be associated, but we can't use correlate. You know, talking about which kinds of variables go with which measures is really uh, a good difference. What are some, some other topics from first semester? We have all the types of variables here for descriptive stats, talking about proportions, talking about means, which of these makes sense to take a mean. You know, it doesn't um, uh, make a lot of sense to come up with a uh, uh, a mean for uh, whether or not you drink coffee or tea, a uh, categorical variable, you might have had coffee or tea or soda or nothing uh, in the caffeine. You, you know, you could think of, it's also nice to show that when you take a variable like caffeine, it really depends how you measure it, right? There's an easy way to think about making that categorical. If you had coffee or tea or soda or nothing, you could make it discrete how many cups of coffee or tea or cola have you had today, or if you really bothered to look it up and think how much caffeine is there per cup of coffee or cup of tea, you could make it virtually continuous variable too. So depending on how you choose to measure these things, you sort of students that they have some choice. Let's go to some other topics. What else are you covering in that first course? Probability. Okay, you could talk at least in, in inferences about proportion, you could certainly talk about that with this data set, if you did it while you were teaching at Monroe Community College, I noticed in our folder that it says MCC is 53% women, 47% men. So you can see, is that true in our class? Uh, is it close to true in our class? Is it within, you made a confidence interval in from our class where we covered that? There's a lot you could talk about with probability and proportion. Other topics? Oh, so I'll make you associate Pulse with some of these. If you think pulse varies by gender, okay, if you think that men have, uh, uh, there might be some evidence from our, uh, from our piece here, there might be a, a little evidence that men have lower pulses than women. I don't know if that's right, but there might be some evidence from it, from our sample of size five. If you think you were going to do that, what, what would that lead to probably as a topic? Uh, probably something like a two sample t-test, right? Because uh, you could check is the mean pulse uh, the same for each gender. So what I like about this is that by collecting a little bit of data in class and involving the class in, in using that, you have topics that, that almost all the basic topics in the class you can cover. The, the, uh, 
with one little data set. Okay. Yeah, it's nice if you have more, because they get tired of one. But with one little data set, and you also update, and if somebody says, you know, another thing I think is important would be in class, you can collect that data in class. I think collecting data in class often, it also I think encourages attendance, because students hate to see themselves as a missing value when you build up that data set. So I think it's good that way too. But almost everything we do, and in fact, one, just one last one I'll mention here is regression and correlation. You can do that with this data if you take pulse, which we could think of as a, I mean, we, we're getting integer values, and in fact, in this case, even integer values. We can think of that as a continuous variable. It's got a, a wide range of possible values over an interval. And take one of the other continuous variables over here and think about, is there correlation? Is there a regression? And I've included on, uh, on the sheet here, uh, one time in class, I collected five, from five people in class, how many hours a week they exercised and what their pulse was. And one exercise I like to do with in-class data, again, this is something you can do from day to day. I want to think about other variables in a minute. But the day I introduce regression, I usually go in and collect that data from five or six people and get hours of exercise per week and pulse rate. And it tends to be aligned with a, a pretty good negative slope. And so we put that up on the board. And what I do is I, I just do a tiny review of straight lines. And I ask people in the class to get in groups. And I say, what equation of a line, what, give an equation of a line that comes close to those points. And so they have to remember a little bit about slope and intercept and try and draw a graph that comes close to those points. And that's nice, because they all get similar but slightly different lines. And then I ask the class, how are we going to decide? All of these lines seem pretty good. How are we going to decide which one's best? And I use that to introduce the idea of uh, vertical deviations and thinking about coming up with some criterion for saying which that a line is best. And it, it just so happened that one day, the five points that came up in class produced the line y equals 72 minus 2x. And those aren't, that's not rounded off. Those are the integer 72 and the integer negative 2. I included that at the bottom just because I think it's such a neat data set. And if you ever need, if, if you're still working at a place where for some reason, you need people to do regression by hand. There's a real data set with real values that gives integer answers, which I just think is so cool I had to include it. Um, but I think this is a nice exercise for learning about regression. And again, you can collect it quickly in class. Anybody have some other favorites you could collect quickly in class? One that somebody yesterday mentioned was the amount of money people have in their pockets. I, I think that can be embarrassing for some students. So I might, I've tried that with amount of change and discovered that students don't have money anymore. Uh, at least, uh, maybe they never did. But I, I've always thought I had some change. But it's amazing how many zeros you get. So I don't like that one. Anybody have a favorite uh, that they collect in class? I have students, but they like to collect. That puts you a little more on the spot. Right. Shoes That's a good idea. Things, but at least it's not a teacher saying, I need to know this of you. Right. Kind of laugh at their classmates saying, oh, let's find out how tall everyone Yeah, so <laughs> they, they discovered that, that they're not so creative as uh, it gives them a little more mercy sometimes. That's a good idea. So you might do some class suggested ones. I collect a whole list of things, one of which is the uh, number of hours of TV watching. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. TV per week is. Uh, that's one that, that's one of the few variables on, on our campus at St. Michael's that you consistently find uh, a gender difference. Definitely more uh, bigger for the men every time I've had somebody study that. Uh, that would be good. Uh, one that, that I think is interesting is with a, res a residential college, it's probably different than a community college, but one of the ones that's highly variable and interesting at a residential college is to get uh, your last phone bill. Because a lot of kids come and spend just a ton of money calling home. Uh, others come in and are really happy to not have to call home. Uh, <laughs> and so that, that you get a really, uh, you often have an, an outlier, especially if you have you know, a student from, say, Thailand. Uh, that can vary, uh, and, and again, people don't usually mind sharing that, at least, especially if you collect that, something like that on a piece of paper, those would be good. But anyway, I, I strongly encourage using some in-class data uh, to illustrate a point. It doesn't always work out like you know, it is. Right, I've done that. I, I've done that. 
those like wins in the front row. There's so much on the pipe up there trying to get it across, and you're going to do this handout so they can see the formula. Yeah. This probability idea is really important, yeah. really useful. Right. You're playing this game. We're just going to play a game here. Right. Birthday. Here we are. How many are born in December? How many are born in January? Then you go through, okay, which day of the month? They just tell you the day of the month, and they just see how many matches you. Yeah. And it's in the book. It's in the, I saw it in Jessica's book, too. Yeah. That is, that's a really good problem. That's a nice one to get across the yeah. idea of sampling. That is a good one. You know, another nice, uh, 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 just give you sort of a uh, up one scale application that it's fun to ask students and if, especially if they have a programmable calculator if you're using a computer and would like to get them to do something with that. You take the same birthday problem and extend it to if you're buying one of these, if you're having a lottery machine and spit out tickets at random for you, how many tickets do you need to buy before your probability that you match two tickets is a half? Which is really the birthday problem but now instead of 365 or six possible birthdays, you have over two million possible lottery tickets. But the number is again surprisingly low. It turns out to be about a thousand in some of the big even though some of the some of the big forty two six lotteries. Because every once in a while you see a note like that in the paper, you know, or that some guy in, in Hicksville bought uh, two uh, bought twenty lottery tickets and two of them turned out to be the same. And it's actually not that surprising, even though uh, it's something that would come up a lot. Good. Any other data collection stories? Before we go on, we got a favorite to share. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave there at advocating that. If you flip to the, the next page of your handout, and, and now I'm coming to a part where I'd like to play request, I, I sort of prepared at least four other activities. I have a few others that I could do off the cuff, but here's four I sort of have ready to go. Uh, and I'll tell you what they are, and you can kind of tell if anybody's got a favorite, I'd be glad to pick these. Uh, Got the random rectangles activity, which is uh, a kind of an introduction to sampling and some ideas about sampling. Uh, the unusual episode activity is a data set that uh, is a little practice reading tables and thinking about a data set for the first time. The spin, spin flip tip activity is sort of an introduction to hypothesis testing for proportions, but also an important uh, idea about sampling and binomial distributions. And capture recapture is a a uh, little quick demonstration of the biological method of, of uh, trying to estimate population size by capture and recapture. Uh, and I'd be glad if anybody's got a, a favorite they'd like to see, or if they have one you've already seen and want to tell me do anything except uh, one of the others. Anybody have one they like? Otherwise we could randomize. Anybody got a going once? Oh, going to do capture recapture. Want to do capture recapture? Okay, I like that one. That's actually I think of this as the day, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving activity, because it's not in most standard textbooks. It's not, uh, it's not kind of a classic elementary stat topic, but it's a really good uh, topic to cover with students on a day when maybe not everybody's there for some reason. So the day before spring break would be a good time to do it in the spring. Uh, so I, I think of it as, as something that's really interesting to teach and you can give a short assignment about maybe for extra credit, uh, but isn't typically in there. So let's do capture recapture, as long as we had a request for that. Capture recapture is often used by biologists in, in real life when the goal is to estimate the size of some population. If you teach at a school like Cornell, where there's all kinds of biologists walking around, Capture and recapture is sort of part of your daily life. Uh, as you walk around the Cornell campus now, you notice that a lot of the crows, there's quite a few on campus, have uh, white tags on their wings. A lot of the squirrels have orange collars. Uh, basically, <laughs> at Cornell, at Cornell, about 85% of the wildlife is tagged. I'm making up that statistic, but uh, there's a lot of tags out there. Uh, we'll do a little simulation of capture recapture, and uh, we'll. Uh, try to make this specific by estimating the number of fish in Lake Tupperware. Okay. One of the smaller Adirondack, probably some of you have been to Tupper Lake, but this is Tupperware Lake. And so we'll take a population of fish. Now, it was pointed out to me yesterday, I actually, we have a way, anybody want to guess how many fish there are in, uh, in Lake Tupperware? Uh, they were, we were stocked them from the fish hatchery at the local tops. There's actually now, 
this is fairly new that they did this. It used to be in weight, but there was some new uh, truth in advertising thing. You now have a pretty good estimate here because on the side, on the nutrition facts, it says serving size, 55 pieces, which I found surprising. Usually these things say like two pieces, you know, and so it doesn't sound high calorie. And then servings for container, about six. So we have some guess that there's about 330, six times 55 uh, fish in the lake, but real biologists don't get nutrition facts about a lake. Uh, they have to go out and try and uh, estimate the number of fish. And the way they do that is by capturing some and tagging them. So what they would typically do, Scott will let you be the volunteer here, take a, take a good, pretty good sized sample of those fish and count how many you got there for me. No eating. So, no predators, right? Pardon? Well, not the money. It, it, we'll, talk, we'll talk about that in a second, though. That's really an important point that we skip a lot in first statistics courses is what are the assumptions of using a certain model? And we'll go over that. Uh, here. 27. 27? Well, amazing. That's how many they captured yesterday, too. Can I have uh, Pardon? Can I have <laughs> no, because I'm, <laughs> the 10 o'clock class gets to. <laughs> you don't know where those have been, either. So we, <laughs> <laughs> we've captured 27 fish. Okay, now what we have to do is to tag them. So to tag them, we'll change their color. So here, count out 27 of these guys. Got them. Uh, will and then when you get 27, put them back in the lake. Uh, so we tag them by making them a different color. Okay. Now actually, I know a good story about this where I gave a demonstration of this, and somebody went and told their department secretary, "Oh, go, when you go to the store, get two kinds of goldfish." So she got cheddar and parmesan, which are the same color. You need the pretzel ones <laughs> to do to do effective tagging here. So we tag the other fish. While we're counting those, putting those 27 back in, let's think about what are the assumptions. A lot of times we do teach, we're going to teach statistical thinking as well as method. We've heard a lot about that in the last day, over, no, yesterday, is we want to teach statistical thinking and not just methods. But obviously, people are going to need to use the methods sometimes. If you use the method, you want to make sure you're in a situation that allows that method. So what are some of the assumptions you'd make about we're not going to, we're going to estimate the population by taking a recapture sample. And one of the things biologists basically assume is this. Okay. What, what, are, what are we assuming when we do that? That there's randomization, that the, that the tagged fish will mix back in with the population. So assumptions include complete mixing of the population. What else? Right, that the population size is constant. How about that the, that the tagging is non-destructive, right? Scott actually liked pretzel goldfish a lot, that, you know, some of those might have disappeared before they got back in. Uh, so the tagging is not destructive. And not just the tagging, but the operation of capturing and recapturing. What might happen with, with a fish that gets captured? It might learn to avoid capture. Okay? So you have to assume that, that the fish or other creatures are not uh, trap shy. That you know you can fool them once, but then they won't. And you also have to, the, and the other one's fun just to bring up because it's such a cool term, that you have to assume the fish are not what biologists call trap happy. Because <laughs> how, do you choose, how do you catch fish? Yeah. What do you use? Bait. They like bait. Anybody who takes young kids fishing knows that there are certain sunfish in the world that seem to have decided that it's in their interest to trade worm for a minute out of the water. You know, this is, okay, worm, kid, back in the water, it's a deal. You know, they, they, so those may be trap happy fish. They might say, hey, that's, you know, you get bait, you gotta spend a minute in the boat, it's kind of a pain out of the water, but oh, you know, I'm willing to do that, depending on how sentient you think fish are. But there's certainly some evidence that in some cases that uh, certain species are trap happy, that they, they learn, oh, there's food in there. That's a lot of assumptions. I mean, that's not a complete list even, but it's a lot of assumptions. With those assumptions, though, we could go ahead and continue to estimate how many uh, fish are in the lake. Let's see. 
Okay, Lori, I'll have you uh, take another sample there and count them and, and separate into how many you have that are pretzel, how many tagged and how many untagged you have. So in our recapture, Recaptured sample, we captured 38 of which four are tagged. How do we use that to estimate the population now? I give some other directions. One of the things I was going to say too, Jessica yesterday was talking about in class activities, how important it is to make sure that they're thought activities. And if you give out a worksheet that says do this and do this and do this, you know, if it becomes sort of what I think of as the chemistry labs I didn't learn anything in, uh, then they're not really much help. And I think that's true. On the other hand, if you make them too wide ranging, they're also not much help because nobody gets the point. I, I've in here concluded, uh, for most of these sheets I've included, most of the exercises I've given you have included fairly detailed worksheets, though are at least sketchy ones for each case. I tend to go with fairly sketchy ones because they take less work to make up. But um, the ones I have in here that have lots of questions on them were usually done by somebody at another school. I acknowledge all the people I borrowed these from on the front. But I think it is, it's a fine line between trying to give enough direction to make an in-class process work well, and so much that it doesn't require any thought to do it. You replace a lecture by another thought, uh, another activity that doesn't necessarily provoke thought in class. So if you're, you're going to bother to replace a lecture with something trying to get at your learning, you have to make sure it's accurate. And that's a tough, it's a tough call. Okay, how are we going to estimate, what's, what's the right ratio to set up to try and estimate, uh, suppose I use capital M for the total population size. I'm not sure that's what I used in the handout, but let's call it that now. What, what's the right ratio to set up to try and estimate the total population size? Yeah, four out of thirty-eight is, 4 out of 38 is 27 over n. looks like twenty-seven over n, right? Because it, we captured uh, it, it looks to us like about four thirty-eight of the population is tagged now, uh, so we want to compare that. We know there's twenty-seven tagged things in the lake, so if you solve that, let's see, you get four n equals twenty-seven. 38, so n equals 27 times 38 over 4. 38 over 4 would be 9 and a half, so that would be 10 27 so is 270 minus the 13 and a half. It would be 256 and a half. So about 257 fish. Okay. So about 257 fish would be our estimate. That's not awful if they really think there's 230 in there. It's pretty hard. Uh, if, if I had math majors in a mathematical statistics class, I'd go through how to, thinking about variance of a hypergeometric distribution and how, how far off you might be actually trying to do this, what, the, what you'd expect for the variance even under the assumptions. And it's pretty hot. It's pretty hard to get a good population estimate, a real good population estimate. But an order of magnitude estimate, which is really what biologists usually care about, comes out pretty well. And again, most people have wildlife experience uh, these days, knowing, in fact, I heard conversations going on yesterday about uh, how deer, you know, now everywhere, people talking about uh, dangerous driving conditions because so, deer populations gotten so big in a lot of places. Uh, in Vermont, the moose population is becoming something of a concern because almost everybody knows somebody now has hit a moose on the highway or come close to hitting a moose on the highway, and that's very dangerous. Uh, because they're, they're you know, very big and they have a high center of gravity and you tend to topple over in your car. Uh, so that's a real uh, classic example. And again, so depending on the level of the class, you can do lots of things with this, but I think it's a really nice uh, pre-vacation sort of activity uh, for people in there. Any questions on that one? Okay. How many people here are just, I just have about Maybe eight minutes left before you should stop for questions uh, and give people a chance to get another snack before the next session. How many people here know the spin flip tip activity? Okay, there's 
Only one. I think we should do that because it's one that's really fun to see on your way out. Uh, let's just have everybody real quickly count off by three. So, sort of, here would be one, two, three, three, one, two, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-twenty, thirty-twenty-one, thirty-twenty-two, thirty-twenty-three, thirty-twenty-four, thirty-twenty-five, thirty-twenty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-twenty, thirty-twenty-one, thirty-twenty-two, thirty-twenty-three, thirty-twenty-four, thirty-twenty-five, thirty-twenty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-twenty, thirty-twenty-one, thirty-twenty-two, thirty-twenty-three, thirty-twenty-four, thirty-twenty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-twenty, thirty-twenty-one, thirty-twenty-two, thirty-twenty-three, thirty-twenty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen, thirty-eighteen, thirty-nineteen, thirty-ten, thirty-eleven, thirty-twelve, thirty-thirteen, thirty-fourteen, thirty-fifteen, thirty-sixteen, thirty-seventeen,
this would be real good. Last night we saw that simulated coin flip on the internet, uh, which I thought was pretty neat. And so we want to see what happens when you do a simulated spin or simulated tip. Speaking of tips, you know, if you want to put any quarters in the bag. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's see, I guess uh, I called it spin flip tip, but I, I mean the spins were number one, right? And flippers were two, so if you put it that order, spin flip tip. Okay, number of spinners, who was the spinner? How many heads you got? How many tails you got? Mark? 51 heads, 72 tails. Oh, okay, is that added up for everybody? I'm sorry? That's added up for everybody? That's everyone. Okay, good. So the... Geez, that's pretty far off from 50-50. Is it surprisingly far off? Well, we could do a z-test and see. Uh, but 70 out of 120, yeah. getting up there. Okay, just about 60% tails spinning. Flippers, uh, what do we have? If you, if you got, each did your own, we can add them up. That's okay. Peter, what'd you have? Uh, 10 heads, 18 tails. Ooh, 10 and 18. What else? Who else? 10 and 16. Ten head and six tails, okay, so that's twenty twenty-four. Five heads and ten tails. Five heads, ten tails. So that's twenty-five thirty-four. Uh, six heads and nine tails. Six heads, thirty-one and forty-three. Uh, ten heads and fifteen tails. Wow, the tails are kicking. <laughs> Interesting. Forty-one and fifty-eight. Not uh just about the same ratio as the spins came out here. Anybody? Uh, oh, oh, oh. I'll bring this back a little bit. 56, 71. Good. That brings us back a little closer to 50, 50. Okay. And how about the tips? We gotta add those up. Uh, uh, what do you guys got? 23 heads and eight tails. 23, eight. I got six heads and one tail. 29, nine. Uh, any other? Well, let's see. The, one, the ones I did, including the three and two we got, and yeah, I did. Oh, you told me. Oh, okay, good. Uh, and so, okay, so that this is a lot more work to get done. 29 and nine. That's actually pretty typical. I haven't kept track of these exactly long term, this one exactly long term. But if you look at, at probability of getting a heads, it appears to me by experience teaching that the probability of getting a heads here is about 0.35 that spins come up tails a big percentage of the time. I know Percy Diaconis has collected this data from classes for years and years and has this in a big way. But the probability of heads is pretty small. Traditionally, as we saw in that internet demonstration last night, this settles down at 50% fairly quickly if you do it. And the probability of getting a heads over here in my experience, and I have kept track of these over class in a long time, is about 78% in my experience. Some people get a little higher than that. So but heads, right. That this is actually just about 75%, just about 30 out of 40. Now, when you do that tipping of coins by putting them on your edge and gently hitting the table, they almost always come up heads. It's really striking that the, they're not equally fair games. So, it's interesting, it's a nice place if you're going to do hypothesis testing for proportions and you want to get some in class data, have people collect this data and make the confidence intervals. And often, what will happen, if you, if, especially if you make it in Assignment. What I often do is give extra credit. I got this idea from Robin Locke at St. Lawrence. I give extra credit if people come in with a picture of 50 pennies standing on their head, uh, on their edge. And Robin has this collection of pictures from St. Lawrence and is really encouraging how many of his students did it. And, but it was also funny that there wasn't one picture of a dorm room that didn't either have a beer bottle or a beer can or a beer logo. Somehow in the picture, every, every picture was like, you know, pennies on edge brought to you by natural light. Uh, but it's really, it, it really is a striking difference, and you can rely on getting confidence intervals that won't cover 50%. Again, it, it does even better. You seem to get even more heads if you just barely touch the table till they fall. If you really bash the table, you kind of turn it into coin flips. The other thing that both Robin and I have learned various times is this is a great exercise to do if you take math and stat out into the elementary schools. If you go to any of your kids' classes or any visit a local school, kids love doing this, but don't have them do the tip demonstration on the floor. 
because those schools are solid. I mean, that's why they're Red Cross emergency things. But both, both of us have had experience that kids decided to do the ticket on the floor because they couldn't find a good table. And then you have the whole class jumping up and down. They don't, they don't move. Those cement floors in the elementary schools are pretty tough. So don't do your tipping experiment on the floor. Get a table. But it's a nice demonstration to a real to hypothesis testing. One of the things that students get wrong a lot, in my experience, students especially who aren't good at math, is, is notice that they think every binomial random variable is probability 0.5 of yes, 0.5 of no. You know, they, they think of everything that's got two outcomes as being a coin flip. Well, they're not. Some are spins and some are tips. Some are flips. Some of them are 50-50, but a lot of things in the world that have two possible outcomes are not 50-50. Right. Um, when Shaquille O'Neal takes a free throw, it is 50-50, but when somebody else does, it might not. So things vary from experiment to experiment, and that's good to remember. Okay, we should stop, because people need some time to get to the other room. Any quick questions? All right. Yeah. People get bored with points, so you can, you can do something a little different. I mean, you can be real creative. And I won't get into too much, but you have to remember with food, a uh, number of chocolate chips, and Mrs. Steele's chocolate chip cookies, uh, yep. they're edible, and so you have a problem with people trying to destroy their... <laughs> right. Uh, Right. There are other things in food groups that they can do as well. Yeah, there are. So there's plenty of projects. If you're going to use projects where they're going to get great, uh, right. they can do some independent work. What I like about this, too, is it does lead itself naturally to projects because any class, no, even your, your dullest class ever, is still going to have a couple kids who say, What about nickels? Go do nickels. Uh, and so actually, it, it seems like they're, they're closer. I, I haven't got the data on nickel. I've had a couple people do it, but I don't know. I don't remember what happened. I don't know if it We got talking yesterday about that certain coins have that certain uh, tendencies to, to come up a certain way for right. particular reasons. Uh, yeah, that's the yeah I, I don't know. And people always are curious about the physics behind it. And I'm sure it's this issue. Oh, I'm sorry. One, one last thing I, I forgot from the Pulse thing. I want to back up for one second because I think it's very important. Uh, and one other idea that, that that's a beautiful lead into it. The one thing I think we have to emphasize in statistics classes that we forget a lot is randomness. I made that whole list of variables of why do people's pulses differ. But one reason they differ, if you think about when we write down the, the real model for regression, for a regression equation, what is it? We think pulse rate depends on some average pulse plus some adjustment due to your own personal characteristics plus random error. And we, we, it's really the hardest statistics is that random error, that there's variability that we have to accommodate that we don't remember. And the randomness is what nobody ever, when I asked for that list of, of variables in, uh, that cause pulses to be different, nobody ever says, even though our room's well as a statistician, nobody ever says randomness. It'll be different next time than it was this time. But it will be different next time just because of random. I mean, there's things in the world we can't explain. And as statisticians and statistics teachers, we should be alert for that randomness and let students know that there's a variation in the world we can't account for. There is no perfect formula to predict pulse or the stock market or the national debt or who will win an election. There's random variability in all those things and that's, there's some of it. We try to account for as much as we can and explain how much we can. See, well, how much of it we can't explain is really a heart of what, at the heart of what we do. Okay, thanks. Enjoy your next session. Thank you. See you later. There's refreshments in 8103, and our next session is 111114 below. Um, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce to the group um, Rick Cleary, who comes to us from Vermont and Cornell. <laughs> um, who is going to talk to us today, I think, about non-traditional teaching methods beyond the statistical lecture. That's right. <laughs> right. You don't so need <laughs> That's right. So welcome, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Pam. I, I want to thank everybody at MCC. It really has been, a, I think, a terrific meeting. The quality of talks yesterday really puts the pressure on uh, to do a good job. And I think we can think of this session, I heard a lot of exciting things about the computer and some and big ideas going on in statistics. I think that's all great. But we all have days where uh, you have to pick your kids up from school early because they're sick and your dentist appointment takes longer than you thought it would and you have something in your backpack at home and you need something to do in class in five minutes and you're not as ready as you know. 
This is that like I, this is like five coupons I think for ooh not quite ready. Where's that handout? Uh, but it's also things I think that are just that you can you can use them in a planned way too. That I, I think it's really valuable to to supplement sort of traditional classes. I'm not, I don't see the dichotomy sort of between necessarily lecture and active learning. Uh, you know, we've all seen sort of bad lectures, and we've all seen lectures that sort of keep people involved. And I think this, what this session is, is lots of ways to try and keep people involved uh, as you're going. So I really appreciate the chance to do these. These are things that I've worked on, kind of collected over the years. Uh, a lot of these uh, came from my friend Robin Locke at St. Lawrence University, who spoke at Beyond the Formula One, and in fact, uh, I think probably was invited, to, he's going to Singapore, and uh, I think I may be interested <coughs> for him. Uh, and several other professors I know contributed uh, some materials that I, I uh, blissfully borrowed uh, to do this. What I have is, is really like five activities that I've prepared uh, to go over. And there's one that I'm trying to do in all, with all three groups, so people have some common ground, and then we'll kind of vote on which other ones to do. But one that I really like to do is this poultry activity that I have on the second page of the handout I just gave you. Jessica talked a little bit about pulses uh, yesterday in her keynote lecture and collecting data about this. And certainly, if for any reason anybody doesn't want to report their pulse, that would be good. But I'd like to start this section by having everybody take their pulse. So if you have a favorite place, either wrist or neck, to find your heart rate, I'll, I'll tell you when to start counting. I'll have you count for 30 seconds, and then we'll double it to get your pulse and beats per minute. So go ahead and find a pulse. We still have one. Ready? Start. Okay, so take the number you just got and double it, and uh, that'll be your, your pulse in beats per minute. And just to show that I'm not afraid to reveal mine, mine was, was 62 uh, just now. I got to count of 31, so I'll double that and get 62. Uh, and what I thought I'd do is I'd like to randomize through the group uh, to get some others. I have a random number table here. If I was doing this in class, I'd have the class follow along on the random number table. But just to get a little randomization, let's see, we've got uh, 3, 6, 10, 15, 18. So I'll go mod 20 down here and get a 12, 3, 6, 10, 12. Is it in the back, Frank? Uh, 72. 72? OK. Mm -hmm. And that's Frank? Is that? Roger. Roger. Sorry, I couldn't read your tag from here. We're trying to get those contacts updated. Uh, okay, and let's see, a 42 would be a 2, that'd be Dan. Okay. We were hoping for more variability than that, Dan. Uh, and uh, a 29, that would be 9, 3, 6, 9. Uh, Todd? Uh, 76. Todd, 76. And I think we want to uh, get at least one more here. Let's see, there's a. Uh, 85 would be 5, that would be uh, Fides. Fides, okay. 76. 76. Good, let's do one more on my table here. Let's see, 53 would be 13, would be Carol. Oh, I'm looking at my name today. 68. 68. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You can make, you can make a note of it. <laughs> well, what do we notice about these? We notice they're not all the same. They they are very they are in fact variable. Uh, so let's ask this question, which classes are, are good at. One of the reasons I like to do this, by the way, is I don't know about your experience with this, but I got interested. I've, I've been interested my whole life in kind of active learning things when I teach statistics. And even when I was young and closer in age to the students and perceived as cooler than I, I think I am today, uh, I'd bring in data from the paper or somewhere and I'd say, look at this neat data set. 
And then I'd say, let's talk about your culture, which I don't think is a particularly dynamic variable. People are, oh, well, me. And so I find that students are more interested the no, your poultry is more interesting than somebody else's national debt. You know, it's just it's sad but true that we are in fact uh, egocentric that way. Uh, so we're, I think we're also statocentric. Uh, so I think it's good to get your own poultry. So why are they different? What are the very, what are the things about people that cause people's poultry rates to be different? Just, let's just name lots of them. You could be a runner. I am a runner, in fact. So let's, let's think of something you could measure about people uh, yeah, maybe hours of exercise per week. That, that's a variable you could measure, uh, measure in class. It's kind of a uh, proxy for several other things. Okay, what are some other things you might measure to try and explain pulse? The gender. Gender, sure. Age. Age. Weight. Weight. Good. Medication. Medication, yeah, people take various medications as an effect on pulse. Smoking. Smoking or non. Ah, good list. Uh, mm -hmm. Any others? Uh, what happened before you came into that? Yeah, re uh, recent, so sort of recent activity, what you've been up to. Uh, yeah, some kind of... <laughs> I, I, I tell a story about it. They might, he might call on me, yeah. So some sort of stretch measure. That's, that's probably a little, I, I love to do this with a full time in class. I love to talk about what could you measure maybe locally <coughs> with students. It might be, do you have an exam today, uh, later today? In which case, they probably would blow my class off. But if they, uh, maybe they, uh, <laughs> maybe, you know, some sort of, well, there are variables you can measure about. Is that, you know, children being sick or? You know, yeah, do you have some stressful thing going on? One, I always think of that sort of stress and excitement. When I think of pulse rates, I used to take my pulse a lot in class in college because I had the, really the world's dullest professor. I know we all have one, but mine's more boring than any of you had. And I took him twice, which shows what dope I was in college. That guy never turned around. I was taking a course in numerical analysis. There was only four of us. He never looked the whole semester. You know, I mean, I wasn't the kind of person who was good at making faces, but it was tempting. But what, it was one of those old style rooms that had a clock that only clicked once a minute. So the only feedback you got in time was every minute it went click a little bit backwards, which was scary, and click forward. <laughs> and so I used to try and take my pulse, and I was running on the cross country team, and you know the aerobics book had just come out, and I thought, okay, I set a goal <laughs> to try and get my pulse under. I, fall, I slept through a lot of that class, but I set a goal <laughs> to try and get my pulse under 50 without falling asleep. <laughs> and <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I think. I'm going to make it. Today I'm going to make it. But then I get excited. <laughs> and those last three weeks, they seem to come fast. And that would be 51, and, uh, and I wouldn't make it. So, you're right. It's certainly, stress, excitement in class makes a difference. Uh, okay. Um, what else? Uh, something with caffeine. How much caffeine you just, I mean, that sort of a. Don't usually think of that as a medication per se, but it's something that, you know, it's a nice second cup of tea. I've seen a lot of people walking around with coffee, so you'd think that would have some effect on, on pulse. You probably think of lots of others. Okay. Uh, good. Let me suggest one more while I'm thinking of it that even in a room full of staff teachers, we almost never say here. One thing that is a cause of the variation that's really kind of the heart of our subject is randomness. There's a lot of it we can't explain. You know, if you think of randomness as being the amount we can't explain, in any sort of model we look at, when we do a two-sample t-test or a regression, if you use some of this data to do a regression of pulse on hours of exercise, there's, those the models have an error term, the random error that just we can't capture. Even knowing all these things about a person, we can't predict their pulse exactly because it's, there's some randomness. It changes over time. There's other things about the person that you need to know that we can't measure. So the randomness, the fact that they, why do they vary? Part of it is randomness. And, and the idea that that randomness is out there is really an important part of statistics, and an important part. And I think when we go from, most of us have come from a math background to teach statistics, it's the part we like to forget uh, or, or don't include. I think of uh, one of my best friends at St. Michael's is a computer science professor, which is not 
allow any randomness in the world. It's unbelievable. And we, were, we were playing golf with a, another friend who was the trainer at St. Michael's, who's not a very good golfer, but he hit a good shot. And my friend, the computer scientist, said, you hit that one well because you really kept your left tip in there while you were coming down, and you didn't open up until, and I said, he's got a program. You know, he's got a program for why I hit a good shot. And I listened to it, and I said, John, it's random, you know, Bill, <laughs> Bill has 100 shots and 30 of them stink and 40 are kind of okay and 30 of them are good and that was one of the good ones, you know. I, uh, I saw randomness, he saw program, but there's a big chunk of this in there and, and so why are they different? We teach statistics because there's this piece, so we shouldn't forget it. Uh, so these are reasons we can test for differences here, but this is one we don't want to forget. So let's move on from that. I think that's a good, whenever you collect data and you're thinking about variability, it's good to remember that random term. I actually forgot it with the blue group, but I got it right, right at the end. I got it right at the end. Right. So when you see them, uh, you if you're discussing this session, bring up the fact that whether I remember to say it or something. I got it in right at the end. Uh, but well, let's, go on to, let's go on to sort of the topics that you do in elementary stats. And think about, see, I, I think collecting one set of data like this, you get it for your whole class, you get some of these variables one day. Maybe if, if you have the facility on campus, make it available to people in Minitab or get them to enter it in a calculator. You can do a lot with it. Let's think about, let's just toss out some topics we do in that first course. Different probabilities. Okay, yeah, we talked about uh, probability distribution. And of course, related to that, I guess uh, we think of that in this problem, we think of that with types of data. You know, you use a, bina a binomial distribution to count categorical responses, yeses or noes. You use a normal distribution in a case where you think you have a, a symmetric distribution of some continuous variable. We can talk a lot about that here because we have all the data types that we never want to discuss, right? We have some categorical things on here, like uh, gender or smoking, non-smoking. We have a lot of things on here that you can explain to students that there's a choice about how you want to measure them. I mean, if you take caffeine, for instance, that's what I like on here, that you think of that as a categorical variable, right? Have you had any today or not? Or if you wanted more categories, you could have, have you had coffee or tea or soda or none, okay? Uh, you, could, you could think of that as a uh, categorical variable. You could think of it as a discrete variable. How many, uh, how many caffeinated drinks have you had today? Or if you looked at a table of, you know, you can see it's not that hard to find how much caffeine there is in coffee relative to tea or soda. So you think of it as a continuous variable by how many milligrams, you could approximate how many milligrams of caffeine have you had today. So you, if I, you can think about which distributions are appropriate for which types of data. So I think from this data you can talk a lot about, and this is something that, that I find even good students uh, starting statistics have a little trouble with. You know, I often use the Moore and McCabe book, which has some correlation right at the start, and I have students do a little project on correlation on campus. And it's surprising how many students will come in and say, oh, I want to find out if smoking is correlated with gender. You think, well, that's great, except those are both binary variables. So you know, and even though hammered in class the idea that you want to pick two either continuous or discrete variables with a big range to use for correlation, people come in and say, I want to, I want to see if this binary variable is correlated with that categorical variable. And think, well, what do we get to the chi-squared so section? And we'll talk about that. But people have, have trouble with that. So I think you can use this data for that. What are some other topics? Graphing. Uh, graphing, right. <laughs> Graphing and presentation of data. You could certainly uh, do that here. Again, with, with a little bit bigger class, you could do side-by-side -side box plots for men, for pulses for men and women. Uh, you could do a lot. Again, you've now got the data to handle most of the basic graphs we do. You can make a histogram of the pulses, talk about whether it appears to follow a normal distribution, whether there's outliers, all those basic things. Uh, what else? Do we do in a right descriptive statistics? We'd have again if we collected this information. What I like to do is collect the pulses, have people write them down, then just have people decide what other variables might be important, and come up with measures and collect all that in class. And then I try and bring it back in in mini tab in the next class. And if I am in a classroom where I can do that, 
So descriptive statistics, you could certainly do that with this data. What else? Pardon? Some inference, sure. You could do some, some, uh, some testing or confidence intervals. Uh, are pulses for men higher than women in this class? In this group, we don't, it doesn't look too different by gender. Uh, and, you know, if you think about extending this uh, so that, that it's not some categorical variable, then we could go to regression and correlation. Because you could think, is, uh, is pulse correlated with, uh, with age? Okay, or with hours of exercise per week. In fact, at the bottom of this page on the handout, uh, I, I have a little data set. Actually, when I, when I start teaching regression, one of my favorite things to do is to get these two variables. Think of x as the hours of exercise per week and y as the pulse rate. And what I like to do in class is this. I like to collect a few points. And that, that's a variable that tends to have a pretty good negative slope. Doesn't always. Sometimes it doesn't come out that well, and I say forget that and try collecting something else. But it usually comes out with a fairly good negative slope. And then I ask people, uh, I, I do just a little tiny review of straight lines, the idea of slope and intercept. And I have them get in groups and say, come up with an equation of a line that comes close to that data. Obviously, the points don't lie on the line, can't hit it exactly, but come up with a line that comes close. And then I get each group to tell me their line and say, how are we going to decide which one's best? And I use that to introduce the idea of squared deviations and say, we need some rule for what's the best line. So I'm going to tell you this rule about squaring the vertical distances. And it might seem arbitrary, but statisticians have reasons for writing that rule. And so let's see which one of these lines does best. And then we get out the textbook and figure out what the best line is. And one day, in just a remarkable coincidence, the data I collected in class, which I have listed in here, produces the regression line y equals 72 minus 2x. And that's not rounded off. That's the integer 72 and the integer <laughs> negative 2. So if for any reason you still teach a class where you want people to do regression by hand and want one that comes out, uh, comes out easy, here's a real data set that I actually collected that the regression line, and plus 72 minus 2x. What a cool line. Because, you know, if you read, uh, I mean, when, if somebody says, what's pulse rate? The classic answer is 72. It's even in, if you, if you want to still try for a little coolness, uh, there's even a Grateful Dead song, right? U.S. Blues, check my pulse, it don't change, day 72, come shine or rain. <laughs> well, uh, there you go, 72 minus 2x. That's, a, I think, a great data set. And what I like is by having one data set to go over several different topics, I can help students see the difference between the association between a continuous response, like pulse, and how you do a two-sample t-test if you want to compare it to something like gender, but it's regression or correlation if you want to see how its relationship with some other continuous variable, like weight or hours of exercise. So I really like collecting one data set. I, I mean, I collect more usually during the course of the semester, but I think that having that one that they can come back to a lot is a help. It also gives them some ownership of the data in class, and you can collect more data in class if you need it. So I think one great way to supplement lectures is more a supplement than a replacement to a traditional class, but is to get some live data. And it's risky, and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes you collect it and what you wanted doesn't happen. But the lesson is usually still there. And then getting to do the randomization, I think, is very valuable, too. I didn't take a lot of time with that group. One of the other things I just left on the, the form, a uh, little room to fill in. What are some other things? Anybody think of some other class variables that might be good? Uh, things that might be... Besides, uh, Pulse is kind of a favorite of mine, but uh, because it's, it's somewhat active, people have to actually count it. Anybody have some other favorites that they've done? Or? Uh, and case arm span. Arm span? Yeah. That, I think that's, that's a good one. Somebody told me yesterday there's a really nice uh, correlation between your the inches from the tip of your elbow to the tip of your finger and your shoe size are very highly correlated. I mean, it makes sense to go measure the size, but it's very, very close to y equals x, apparently. Um, yeah, that might be a qubit. Yeah, four, four qubits in a span, I remember reading somewhere once. So that, that's probably right. Uh, so there's some neat, uh, there are some other neat measures. Anybody else have a favorite? Yeah. <coughs> what? Have 
circumference? Yeah, tape measures, tape measures. Yeah, that's good because that's one we you can. Power lane. We did all sorts of stuff the first day. Right. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I like those. A lot of those physical ones, I think, are good. Uh, somebody was talking about using amount of money or amount of change, but in my experience now, too many people have zero. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> really don't carry much money, uh, especially if they're just you know if they're between classes, or especially at a residential school. They take money if they're specifically going to the bookstore or something, but if they're just walking to class, a lot of St. Michael students and Cornell students don't seem to have any uh, money on them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They all have cars next to me and no money. It kind of bothers me. Uh, and any others that people like? I think uh, some of those are, you know, if you have favorites, you, people will discover them. I mean, I, I like to, uh, I sometimes if I want a discrete variable, I often do how many exams do you have this week? Uh, is a pretty good one, and uh, you know, it's always embarrassing when students don't know that. But credit hours earned so far is a good one. Right? How many hours a week did you work last summer is pretty variable. Um, Sometimes a good thing to do. I, I, I haven't done it. You know, the first day of class, which is usually busy work time, is a good time to pass out a survey. And get yeah, I've done that. I, I've done that several first day surveys and then uh, that given that later on, yeah. yeah. It's interesting that they do that the first day and ask students to predict, I've done that in, in freshman classes, and ask students, what do you think your GPA will be this semester? <laughs> that has no variability at all. They all say three of them. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're, the good students uh, talk themselves down a little bit. A few of them say a little higher. And the crummy students are optimistic, and they all say three O's. Unbelievable uh, how consistent that is. And I guess that's people. Who, I, I know a couple of people who've taught courses where they said you can grade yourself, and they say everybody gets a B because the good students uh, know they didn't work as hard as they might have, and the crummy students want to give themselves a good grade. So uh, anyway, I guess at some schools that with grade inflation that would be A minus now. But. Okay, any other comments on, on this activity? So what I like about this is just a chance to get lots and lots of in-class data and you know you can collect it, it on a day when, when it just seems like the class is not involved, it's a way to get things started and to sort of a good review of what you've done and introduce some other things. On the next page I, I have four other activities that I've sort of prepared that I have really ready to go. And uh, we could play requests or ones that if people have seen them too much, we could skip them. I, I've now done most of them in at least one of the other groups. We probably have time for one or two more of these, so let me just tell you briefly about them. Uh, random rectangles activity is a little bit of an introduction to sampling and thinking about issues uh, in obtaining a random sample and kind of an introduction to uh, the idea that the sample mean is variable. Unusual episode activity is a, a data set, kind of a beginning data set problem where you try to interpret a little bit of uh, data. The spin flip tip activity is an uh, uh, introduction to uh, hypothesis testing through uh, uh, using coins to see uh, what the, we saw last night that demonstration on the internet that long runs of coin flips tend to be about half head, but we do that with some other actions you can take on coins. Or capture recapture activity which is uh, uh, a biology-based uh, introduction to trying to estimate populations the way that biologists do with uh, tagging data. And so I would be glad, if, uh, I, I just assume play requests here, if the group, uh, somebody has one they'd like to see, or uh, somebody knows one very well and would want me to skip it, and you know, wants to say, do anything except that. Uh, otherwise, I'm willing to randomize what we do, which I also like to do in class sometimes. Uh, any, uh, any favorites? Capture, recapture? Okay. I've done that in both other groups, but I think that's okay. Uh, it seems to have gone pretty well. So, capture, recapture. Biologists use this to try and estimate. The goal is to estimate the population of... You want to estimate the size of an unknown population. Let's put it that way. And this is one where... Something Jessica said yesterday in her keynote address, which I thought was really good. There is a real tendency in when you're doing things in class, uh, uh, let me put it this way, there's a real tension between 
how much to give the students on a worksheet. Because if you give them too much and just say do this, then it becomes kind of what I think of as the useless chemistry labs I had in college, where I didn't learn anything. I just followed this recipe and I handed in my white gunk and got whatever grade. But if you don't give them en to enough, it's kind of chaotic and the lesson is often lost. And I tried in, in here, I included, for instance, on the random rectangles activity that's in here, there's a very detailed sheet uh, that was first made up by Tom Moore at Grinnell that leads people through that, that I don't think is too detailed, but is more detailed than I would usually write it. Because again, I'm, well, I'm usually lazier about these things than Tom, who made a, 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 a long sheet. So I, I've included a sheet to try and lead people through that, this activity. But for, in class today, we'll just try and go through it. If you teach at a place like Cornell, capture recapture is sort of always on your mind. Because as you walk around campus, you notice that like a lot of the crows have a white flap on their wing, and a lot of the squirrels wear little orange collars. And basically, 85% of the animals on the Cornell campus are tagged. Uh, <laughs> and because there's so many biology students that are doing so many projects, some of them are probably tagged several times. Um, but this, this experiment has several things I like to do. I like this particular experiment. I've, I think I've done this the day before Thanksgiving in almost every class I've ever taught. Uh, because it's a real good activity that's not in the curriculum in most beginning courses, but makes a nice little extra credit or optional homework uh, and it's an interesting thing to do. You know, a lot of times that, that day before Thanksgiving or the day before spring break, you don't want to waste the time of the kids who came. And yet you hate to cover new material when only a third of your class is there, uh, or only half your class is there when you're, if your attendance is usually good. So I find this a real good uh, day before vacation activity. So what we want to do is we're going to estimate the uh, population of goldfish in Lake Tupperware. Okay, so there's our example. Uh, I'm going to estimate the number of goldfish in this lake. Now, thanks to recent developments in the truth and advertising law, the serving sizes on these packages recently got changed from something in ounces to number of fish. So we actually have an estimate on here that a serving size is 55 pieces, servings per container about six. So there's about 330 fish in the lake, uh, according to the package. But let's say about how a biologist not given nutrition information about a real lake uh, would go about doing that. So here's the lake, got some number of fish in it. Capture recapture goes like this. We want to capture some of the fish and uh, tag them. I'll ask, I'll ask Pam to take a sample of the fish, take a good handful, and then count how many you got there. So that's a, our number captured. So we start by Going ahead and, and capturing some of the fish in the lake and seeing how many we got. 33. 33? Okay. And now we need to replace them with, we need to tag them. And the way we'll do this is we'll replace them with pretzel fish, which are a different color. So we could count 33 of those and put them in the lake, that would be great. Actually, I have a good try. I did this demonstration a couple of years ago, and a friend of mine uh, decided to do it in class and forgot to pick up the stuff. Uh, and called his department secretary, who we knew it was coming in after him, and said, stop and get two kinds of goldfish. So she got, like, Parmesan and cheddar, but they're the same color. <laughs> 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 so, so there's the delay that. Um, and those, those things can happen. So make sure you get uh, a good tagging system. So we got the 33 tagged fish in the lake. So now, we have tagged fish in the lake. The one thing I really like to do to get a uh, discussion going with students on the day I do this is very much, one, besides the randomness issue, which I brought up with the pulse rates, one of the other things we should bring up a lot, I think, is, is assumptions. We're talking about statistical thinking and methods at this conference. And we want to go beyond the formula, but part of doing that, I think, is deciding when methods are appropriate. You know, if you're going to look up a formula or do something on a computer, when is it appropriate? What assumptions are you making that we're going to do this? So let's think about the assumptions you need, you need to actually estimate this population. And the biggest one is that if you're using a capture recapture, you really want to think of what the statistical equivalent assumption to doing this, that once the tagged fish are in, we mix them up. So probably the biggest assumption you make in doing capture recapture is that there's some mixing of the population once those are in there. So Assumptions include complete mixing 
of the population. Now to let that happen, if you're a biologist, it means you want to take some time between the capture and the recapture. But what's the problem if you take time between capture and recapture? The population changes, right? Uh, fish die, other fish are born, uh, farmers have runoff, you know, storms, uh, all kinds of things happen. See, you are assuming complete mixing of population, but you're also assuming that the population is relatively constant, is in fact constant over time. And those are basically contradictory assumptions. You know, it's hard to have both of those in a real biological system. So it's trying to time this so that both of those assumptions are still reasonable. Uh, and whether they're reasonable in certain populations would certainly depend on knowledge of those fish. What else uh, are you assuming? Not just the entire population is constant, but something that... Yeah, still there too. the capture pot, right. One, one of the things that, is that you have to assume is that, that the tagging process is non-destructive. That uh, the fact that you tagged the fish uh, didn't reduce the population of the tag ones. And also now we're going to take a sample, a second, we're going to take another sample and see what percentage of tagged fish are in the second sample. But, uh, what you have to hope is that the captured fish are not, this is one of my favorite biological terms and it's fun to bring up in discussion. The, the captured fish are not trap happy. <laughs> because how do you catch fish? Or crows or almost anything else. You use bait. Right? Now anybody who's taken kids fishing or been fishing when you're a kid knows that at a lot of lakes around central New York there are a lot of like sunfish and perch who basically seem to have come across the idea that it's a reasonable mercantile exchange to get a worm in exchange and a hook in the, in the gill for about a minute out of the water. You know, it, it just seems like, okay, worm, kid, back in water, it's a deal. Uh, for a lot of those, and they, they may be what you call, you know, fish may learn, ah, there's food in these things. And, you know, be willing to exchange a minute out of the water. Uh, to get that. But on the other hand, they might learn that, that being out of the water is uh, a difficult experience. And so it could be that they learn not to get captured from other time, which is a real problem when you're trying to estimate these populations. So there's a lot of assumptions. I mean, that's not even a thorough list. But there's a lot of assumptions here of independence and doing all that. So if we feel we have all that, I'll go over this. I'll let Dan take our, our recapture sample. Good handful and count how many you got and, uh, and how many of them were tagged. The pretzel ones are the tagged ones. So uh, let's do our, our estimate here. When we do the recapture, we got Capture, we got 30, we got three tagged fish out of 38. So if all our assumptions hold and we had good mixing and it was random sample and the population didn't change, how do we estimate the population uh, now? If I use capital M for population, it appears that according to our second sample, that 338 of the fish in the lake are tagged. Okay. Uh, we know we tagged 33 fish. Uh, so the ratio we want to set up would, would be that we think 338 to the fish are tagged. We got 33 before. So we get n is, uh, let's see, 3n equals 33 times 38. n equals 11 times 38. 38 and 38 is 418. So we'd estimate 418 fish, right order of magnitude. They said about, and the package is said about 330. We, got, we estimated 400. If you have like a sophomore, if you have math major types who've had some calculus, 
It's fun to do, think about the inherent variance in a hypergeometric distribution, and you can actually think about whether you are within reasonable confidence limit for this. And it turns out it's a pretty variable process. In fact, these are almost exactly the same numbers as in the last group, where if you get 4 out of 38, you know, you see it's much lower. You reduce this by a third, you are pretty close. It makes a big difference uh, how many that you wind up capturing. But it really is a big, uh, you know, I mean, right order of magnitude, certainly. And that's usually what biologists are interested in. I find students are pretty interested in this problem if you, again, bring it home to them, because most, of them, most people live in an area where there's some kind of wildlife that people are worried about the population from. Certainly in, in St. Michael's and northern Vermont, people worry about moose now, uh, which they didn't a few years ago. But almost everybody has either seen a moose or had a close call with a moose or knows somebody who ran into a moose, because the moose population has really come back in northern Vermont. Uh, and I know that in, you know, it's certainly true with deer in many places. That, and so people are really worried about population sizes. And so I, I find that's, that's a real nice in class activity. If you bring, you know, enough uh, populations, you can have, it's fun, uh, you know, if you are willing to do it or have it in the departmental budget, to bring several of these uh, of each type and have several students try and estimate how many there are in a bag. Uh, see how many of them notice the nutrition facts on the side. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought of that until yesterday. And the uh, green group pointed it out. Any questions on that one? Okay. Uh, we've got about eight minutes left. We could maybe do uh, one more. Let's look at the unusual episode one. I haven't done, you guys might know this one, but I haven't done that in any other group yet. That's the only one I prepared and didn't do. So I'd feel better if we went to that. <laughs> You'll notice this is the only one I didn't kind of write a handout for either. I want you to notice uh, in your middle of your handout, there's this table that says population at risk, deaths, and death rates for an unusual episode. Uh, there's a couple things about this, but just take a minute and look over that, uh, that thing. There's a group of people here who are exposed to an unusual risk. And it's really the top table that I find particularly interesting. There is a little error in the bottom table, by the way, and I, I don't know who to credit with first making this one up, but uh, I like this one a great deal. And you look through and you see uh, what's going on. You have certain people exposed to a risk, uh, and the, uh, you know something about their economic status. Uh, status one, economic status one would be sort of higher class, uh, three is lower class, and for uh, adult child, and then on the, the lower tables is, is fine too. Actually, I think except the, the deaths per 100 are not so interesting. Let's take a look, uh, and I'm not sure to correct, but let's take a look at just the number of deaths, the, the raw numbers in both tables. And you have by, uh, by both economic status and age and economic status and gender, you have uh, death rates for uh, people exposed to a risk. So what do you notice? Anybody uh, just want to hazard some things you can pick out from this table? Children are protected in groups one and two and not group three. Children are protected in groups one and two, right. So somehow uh, children of economic privilege were able to uh, escape uh, escape in, with their lives and when exposed to this risk. Uh, so, you know, having money is, is good for your kids, at least uh, against this particular risk. Uh, even the adults, uh, you, you were much better off, right? The people did much better in the higher economic strata. Uh, what else? Females, uh, females definitely respond better to this risk. Uh, certainly survived in a much higher rate. Uh, so, I, and I think those are the things that, that come through is, in general, uh, uh, adult males were in, uh, were in hot water exposed to this risk. So, you might ask uh, people to speculate on a cause. Uh, what, what was, what kind of risk would, might this be? It would seem like maybe, a, that, that's one that people bring up a lot is that, if, you know, if you were, uh, if you had a town that was about to be occupied, uh, perhaps, and perhaps the risk was advance of an enemy uh, that, uh, you know, 
men stay behind to fight, women and children clear out, but people who can't afford to get out. That, that's one people bring up a lot. Any other guesses? Flood would be another one that tends to people, uh, flood would, that would actually be, I'd love to have a number for like the, the Johnstown flood or some of the other uh, great floods in U.S. history. That's not it, but I think that's another great guess. Hmm? Uh, yeah, although these would be awfully high death rates for any. Uh, it is in fact the Titanic. Uh, this is the this is the data from the Titanic, and I, I think people might get it faster now that with the movie out. Uh, in in other years in class, uh, I've had good luck using this data set. And what I like about it is at the end, I, I always like to prompt them with, "Oh, it was sad," because almost everybody had sang that song sometime in grade school about the Titanic going down. Uh, and so this is the the data from the Titanic, which you know now with the the movie being out this year. People might, I tried it this year and a couple kids did right away go, I bet it's Titanic. And uh, so uh, I think, especially when the current generation apparently of like 8th through 10th grade girls is in college, they might still be thinking of, uh, and as young women, they may still remember that movie. It seems to be, have captured that audience particularly well. So it might be hard to use this one for a few years now. But it is a, it's a really fun data set. Uh, I like to use this one when I first introduce the two-way tables or even earlier in the course to just think about statistical thinking. And then, of course, what, it, what the physical reason is is that people on the higher decks did better. And you economic, the higher your economic status, the higher up you were on the ship. Uh, and women and children first being the general lifeboat rule uh, explained how well uh, uh, the fact that they did better there. So that's one of my favorite uh, just data sets. There are, one of the other things that I didn't bother to include in this one because it, this, I wanted to make this the non-computer session, but there is an awful lot of good data on the inter internet now, and several good places to look. Uh, and so feel free to take any questions uh, about any of those. Uh, I, the other ones, uh, the other activities I did in at least one other group, so uh, people have notes on that one, and you can, uh, but feel free to write me if you have any questions on any of those. So I guess I'll just stop there and take any questions or comments or hear about other people's favorites. Jim? Uh, what, in, in connection with this unusual episode, uh, it's, it's uh, instructive to see what uh, data can be used as clues. Mm -hmm. uh, but what other goals do you have in a statistics setting? That, that's a good question. What I have as a goal in that one is exactly, exactly that, to just try and notice how much you can read from a table and how much you, you can't. What I like is that some students, what, if you ask for suggestions of what it might be, you'll find that students develop very powerful theories as to what it might be and will express a surprising amount of confidence in what they think it is. Uh, and they're, they're very, you know, their theory is reasonable. The data would fit their theory. But the fact is, they form the theory right away, and then they keep making the data fit. So my particular goal, I'm glad you asked that, because I didn't get a chance to say that so much, but my particular goal is that, that in the absence of, that if people will use data to support a theory they already have. One, one other famous, uh, real good demonstration, I, again, I didn't bring this one, one either, but we got about two minutes to do this. I don't, no, I don't have the overheads with me, but here's a, a real good data set that I use to introduce the same point. I often divide the class up into three groups, so I'm count off by threes, group one, group two, group three. I'll have group two and three close their eyes, and, and for group one, I'll put up an overhead that describes this experiment. This is in uh, Jim Berger's book on Bayesian statistics. And I'll put up a, a statistic that says, you're at a party where uh, one of the guests claims to be able to tell a New York red wine from a California red wine with a single set. You randomly select 10 different wines, some from New York, some from California, present them all 10 in a blind test, and the guest gets all 10 right. I try to, I try to keep it get gender neutral and call it the guest all the way through. I say the guest gets all 10 right. Is this evidence of skill in wine tasting? And, uh, or was it just luck? And you vote yes or no. Then I have them close their eyes, and group two open their eyes, and I put up a virtually the same shape overhead, but it says uh, a guest at a party claims to be able to tell uh, from a set 
whether coffee or milk was poured into a cup first. So you randomly take 10 cups and pour in either coffee or milk first, and it gets, tastes all 10, and gets all 10 correct. Is this evidence of skill or is it evidence of one? And then I put up, then I have the third group open their eyes, and they see one that says, uh, a guest at a party uh, who's had rather a lot to drink claims to have psychic powers uh, and can predict the, call, the result of a coin flip in another room. You give the guest a blind test uh, and flip a coin 10 times in another room and have the guest and the drunk guy, the drunk person uh, predict heads or tails, they get all 10 right. Is this evidence of skill or is it evidence of luck? And it's the same statistical evidence in each case. You've seen somebody get a binomial trial correct 10 times in a row. But everybody says the first one's skill, and everybody says the last one's luck, and they split pretty much evenly on the coffee and milk, because you can't tell. So the fact is that if we have a theory, we, we use statistics to support what we think is believable, and that all the evidence we see, uh, we interpret in light of what we already think possible and already know. And so I try to use it uh, as kind of an argument for not strictly using statistics to support what you already think, but to try and look at the data uh, and see what can you say from it, as, how far can you conclude. Yeah, I have that all the time, I don't know if you guys collect projects, but I get this all the time, where students will do a really good job on a project to say, uh, do women own more CDs than men? You know, that I have most of my students do a two sample t-test project and go out and collect data on campus. You'll have somebody come back and they'll have their project just right, and then they'll make their, their last sentence will say, so I'm able to conclude you know, with, with high confidence that women own more CDs on average than men. And if they stopped right there, they'd have a B plus or A minus. And then they had a last sentence saying, this is because more women at St. Michael's work more hours and so they have more disposable income. And they just have all this crap all it doesn't have anything to do that might be right and it might be reasonable, but it doesn't have anything to do with what they know. And I really think that's very important that we try and get people to not project the little bit of data they collect on that some bigger theory that the data doesn't address. But that, doesn't that mean that you ought to finish the business on the Titanic by saying, yes, this is, this is data from the Titanic, but that's not what you should do with data to right. figure out where it came from. That's right. I mean, it is, it is a trick. And that, it's something you have to be very careful with. Uh, I'm glad you bring it up. It's a good, you have to be very careful using real data and counterexamples and fun things in class because it is easy to get students to the point where they think all statistics is unreliable, which, is, which would be a shame. Uh, that, that they look for the tricks too much. I noticed yesterday when Jessica put up the thing about uh, uh, weights of students and said, what do you think of this? And right away somebody said, well, how good was your sample? Well, you know, I think you, that wasn't really the point of that exercise, but that was somebody who was very, very skeptical. And, and it's okay, you want to breed a certain skepticism, but you want, don't want them to think statistics is useless either. So you, you do have to be careful of doing too many counterexamples. That's a really good point. Okay, I, I should stop there so people have time to go get uh, another refreshment before their 11 o'clock uh, meeting. So. Are you Pardon? Uh, yeah, let me put those back in.